Welcome back to EV News Daily. Coming up today, Rivian announces not one, not two, but three new electric vehicles. A two-seater Tesla Model Y and Arnic 5 offers. Plus, stay tuned, because later in the show, I'll tell you what Stellantis are saying about their plan for cheaper electric vehicles. Well, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you are in the world. Welcome to EV News Daily, your trusted source of EV information. Last one of the week, it's Friday, 8th of March. I'm Martin Lee, and I go through every EV story that I can find so you don't have to. Hopefully in 20 minutes or so a day, we can save you so much time and just bring you what you need to know. We go live at 5 p.m. UK, that's midday Eastern. Our Patreon supporters, though, get the episodes as soon as they're ready and ad-free. Be like them by clicking on a link in the show notes. We love it when new EVs get announced, and these were really cool announcements by Rivian yesterday, just after this show goes live. So we've had a few hours to kind of digest the news, actually. So rather than breaking news, hopefully we can add a little bit of context. I'll give you my opinion at the end of the new segment on this, but Rivian announced three new electric SUV models, the R2, the R3, and the RX, although calling them crossovers, uh, the R3 and the RX, they're certainly chunky, smaller cars, but you'd call them more like a Volkswagen Golf size, really. It was at an informal event at Laguna Beach in California. I must say that the style of the event was, I thought, significant. It was quite a small venue, which they'd packed, obviously, you know, oversubscribed guest list. But the way that they did it, I thought, was interesting. Almost in the round, there were people on certainly three sides of RJ Scarringe with the cars rotating in the middle and a big LED screen at one end. But it felt felt very intimate and the crowd at least were sitting very close to him, unlike, you know, I you know, like, like a big pop gig where there's or, or an Elon Musk Tesla event where the crowd are kind of behind crash barriers. So it, it felt very well, Rivian, actually, which is probably a good thing. Now, we were there to hear about the R2. Now, you know the R1 series, the R1S, well, R1T. This, that's their flagship. The R2 is positioned as their smaller and more economical vehicles. It's priced at approximately $45,000 to begin with. That compares to the starting price of $70,000 for the flagship series. They said it will offer from three uh, up to 300 miles of range or rather, it will offer 300 miles of range in any form of configuration. The three configurations are single, dual, or triple motor. Now, those triple motors are going to be beasts, but very specific language they used, and I'll get into that in a moment, but any of those configurations will have over 300 miles of range. It's slated for release in the first half of 2026. Well, the Rivian R2 is aimed firmly at the Tesla Model Y and the Mach-E market. The R2 showcases uh, what's still a rugged, boxy design reminiscent of the R1S, including Rivian's signature light bar, tow hooks, big frunk up the front. The interior has dual screens and Rivian's own software, so no Apple CarPlay here. A new steering wheel with haptic dials, double glove boxes, which got a big cheer, and fold flat seating for versatile cargo spaces. Now, two battery sizes will be offered, with the larger expected to be the one that delivers over the 300 miles of range. As confirmed to MKBHD in his own YouTube interview with Mr. Scaringe, he asked him the direct question, hey, that 300 miles thing is that uh, what size battery pack and rj was like okay so there's two battery pack sizes which i think they didn't hide but they didn't go out of their way to talk about the smaller battery pack will not do 300 miles and and marcus said is it a small physically smaller he said yeah it's a smaller battery pack and that won't do 300 that'll be the entry price but there will be 300 miles available on all of the three motor options which go you know over that distance so i thought just for clarification rivian is introducing a new battery cell form factor named 40 695 uh, for 46 millimeters in diameter, 95 millimeters in height, and they say that will give them improved performance. Looking at the the styling of this, it's you know it's very much in the Rivian mold. They haven't just shrunk the R1S, but there's definitely a family resemblance there. There's also a little bit of resemblance, if I may say, to maybe a Volvo XC40, and uh, that's also a good thing because that's a very good looking car. But this is firmly in that Model Y market, and that's also a good thing because, well, what's the world's best-selling passenger car? 
yeah, you beat me to the punchline, that would be the Model Y. Well, Rivian's now accepting reservations for the R2 with the tri-motor variant capable of, accept, uh, of accelerating 0 to 60 miles an hour in under three seconds, they say. Advanced autonomy will be possible with 11 cameras and five radars, one on each corner and a, a main radar as well facing forward, allowing for hands-free highway driving as the tech and the software with those self-driving features catches up. Unique features of the R2 include the removable flashlight in the driver's side door for outdoor activities. Rivian fans will be happy that that's there. A fully retractable passenger and rear seat window for open air driving. You know, they talked about having the surfboard hanging out the back and all that kind of stuff. Very lifestyle-y. Uh, double glove boxes, as, as I've mentioned, and the fold flat seats, I think, look really interesting. Now, th it's got a, a flat floor in the boot, which can be removed for an even deeper bit of storage, but you can have that, that kind of raised height flat floor, which then brings the height up to the rear seats that fold down, but also the front two seats fold completely flat. Now, I think you take the headrests out and then they will fold over. And they talked about having an inflatable airbed, which would you know, fill in that little gap between the rear seats and the front seats uh, that you'd fall down otherwise, but having a perfectly flat surface for camping. Now, uh, I love the idea of it. I think I aspire to having an adventure vehicle like this. I know that I would never use this feature because uh, I'm not going to be going camping in this. But if you are, that's great. And also that's kind of the dream that Rivian are selling, if that makes sense. And so even if you never use this feature, I know I'm fully bought into this. Well, the launch of these three models comes at a crucial time for Rivian as it seeks to scale up production and reduce costs amidst financial challenges in a very competitive marketplace. Rivian deciding to halt construction of their new factory in Georgia it was a significant moment yesterday, aiming to reduce their capital expenditure of $2.25 saved and relocating the production of these models, the R2 particular, into their existing Illinois normal facility that allows for earlier delivery in the first half of 2026. They have capacity and those production lines there, which it will close later in the year for retooling, and they're going to make it more um, efficient and more cost effective as well at that uh, normal facility. But uh, they praised the team in Georgia and said that that it was definitely something that I think they aspire to having that facility one day. They'd secured $1.5 billion of incentives in a package from Georgia for the plant to create 7,500 jobs by 2028. But that is very much, let's say, on the back burner for now. And that's, you know, that is entirely sensible because you know, my opinion on this, I'd mentioned that I'll give you my thoughts at the end of the news piece, is I really want Rivian to survive. But there is no guarantee that any of these new car companies, any existing car company actually in this, this transition from combustion to electric are going to make it in, in any way, shape or form. Now, Rivian has one of the best chances of doing that. And the R2 is Rivian's ticket to success as the Model 3 was Tesla's and then obviously the Model Y. And interestingly, Cybertruck, the much hyped Cybertruck on recent earnings calls with Tesla, they say, well, we're in a bit of a kind of innovation lull at the minute and the company won't really be a growth company again now until, you know, the Model 2 comes out and just brushing the Cybertruck away. Like we waited all these years for it. And then on the earnings call, they were like, yeah, we're not really going to be a growth company now until, you know, the the small form factor car, and you wow, <laughs> talk about kicking the Cybertruck. But that's the case with Rivian as well. The R1S and the R1T, I think, lose between forty and $50,000 per vehicle they sell at the moment, which is you know what I've read. And, and if you're a financial expert on these things, I'd love to learn from you in the comments. But Rivian's vertically integrated approach to building these new R2s, and we'll get onto the R3s in a moment, um, the electronics, the software, the user experience, I think, all makes a lot of sense. Let's talk about those new, those new small form factor cars, though, which really blew everyone away and, and perhaps stole a little bit of the air out of the room in terms of the focus being on the R2. Actually, before we do move on to the R3 and the R3X, just for the YouTube viewers of the podcast, I'll show you a couple of things. They sent a nice little like, kind of whizzy 360 view of the R2, and that gives, uh, I think, a, a glimpse of how it's, uh, the, the back end completely opens up. We can sit on the tailgate, how the rear doors are really wide opening as well. You get a few glimpses of the interior, and it's a powered opening front, but not a powered close. And there's lots of those little 
cost-saving things around this vehicle, which I don't think, you know, really are night and day, are they? You know, it's got a power opening, but not a power closing front, then, you know, big deal. But if that saves some money here and there, it helps bring that in at the right price point. Also, I did get sent a really interesting fact sheet from Rivian's PR with the details of the length, the width, the height, etc. in terms of the R1S versus the R2. I'll pop that on screen for the YouTube viewers in case you want to hit pause and have a look at that a little bit more closely. And they also sent a really cool uh, sort of superimposed image of the R2 with the outline of the R1S over the top of it. And I think, you know, you can really see here that the wheelbase is only a little bit shorter, but the big differences are it's a much lower vehicle. In fact, when RJ, who's a tall guy, was standing next to it, he, you know, he, he towered above the R2. And of course, that much shorter as well in terms of this couldn't be a three row. It's only ever going to be a five seater vehicle. So a lot less space in the back. But that's why it is you know, not less, not half the price, but a significant price reduction on this vehicle. But frankly, so many families say they need a big vehicle, but then they see a vehicle as big as the R1S and go, <laughs> doesn't really kind of suit our life or parking it and things like that. And so that's why the R2 hits a real sweet spot for so many people. Okay, let's get on and talk about the, the surprise. One more thing, or really two more things. The two models that Rivian introduced, the R3 and the R3X, smaller entry-level electric SUVs, crossovers, they kind of called them, but I mean, it's nothing really more than a Volkswagen golf size vehicle when you look at the um, dimensions debuting around 2027. So there's a little bit of this is what you could get if we stick around. And hopefully, like I say, Rivian's got one of the greatest chances of surviving in EV world as a startup. Both models five inches shorter than the larger R2, designed to offer a compact and efficient option in Rivian's electric vehicle range. And I do think this is as cute as it gets and uh, you know everyone's favorite thing has been to post what this car looks like whether it is you know a larder or something because there is a, something about the rear end of this vehicle which is instantly so familiar but also it's very unique and Rivian styling is very much a family resemblance they haven't got rid of the headlamps of course and you know we're talking about a vehicle that's three years away but the R3 features the signature design and the power operated rear hatch with a full width tail light and a separate opening rear glass, very Range Rover. So just the top glass of the back will open up uh, to store long items, uh, surfboards, I think they said, a trombone. You know, they sort of joked about it on the live stream. Expected to inherit the drivetrain options from the R2. The R3 aims to deliver over 300 miles of range and support fast charging using the J3400 connector, which is a good point. I haven't mentioned the J3400, have I? No, because these cars natively will come J with J3400. And it's, it's interesting because on the R2, it's on the rear uh, rear corner of the bumper, quite low down, but it's a small hatch, a small opening, like well, like Teslas have a small. Uh, they they don't anything. It's not CCS one, so they don't need anything bigger. And the R three has it on the side, a more conventional place. It's on the the right hand passenger side of the vehicle if you're on a left-hand drive market. Um, but again, a very small, almost discreet opening that just shows another one of the benefits of going to the J3400 connector, not CCS1, uh, in that it's just so much smaller and, and nicer to use. R3, like I mentioned, single, dual, and triple motor for the R3X variant. So what's the R3X? Well, for a start, it's not exactly the same as the R3. It's a little bit wider and it will have a tri-motor powertrain. Where on earth they're going to put three motors in this thing? Now, obviously, they're betting on motor technology getting smaller because this is a very compact vehicle and they're going to fit three motors inside it. I mean, that's a challenge on, you know, on a Model S Plaid. So <laughs> you're going to get three motors in here. I guess that they're working on some really interesting technology that shrinks things down. But either way, higher ground clearance, wider wheels and tyres, and actually a physically a wider track on this vehicle as well. Again, it's very much a proof of concept. This isn't coming out tomorrow, so, you know, a little bit of caution needed. Uh, but otherwise, very cool orange accents on this. And again, I'm, I'm firmly in love with this vehicle, not just because here we have smaller vehicles here in Europe, but just because I think this looks so cool. R3 and R3X interiors have spacious cabins, really nice uh, kind of seats in the Rivian family design, big glass roofs as well. And again, you know, if the R2 is coming in at $45,000, maybe this will be forty. I don't know. It's pure speculation, but... It, it's really impressive what Rivian have done. And I know I've gone on for a long time on this podcast about these three vehicles. And, and in a way, the R3s took some of the heat that the R2 should have should have got today. But um, they need to, well, they know, everyone knows. They've got to bring the R2 to market 
as soon as possible. Now, orders are open, as I mentioned, and the quicker they can get these out profitably and get that company in the black, it's going to be a big day for everyone. And not least, RJ Scarring, who, who, who was brilliant at the, the presentation and has been with this since day one. And Rivian has taken a long time to find its, 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 it, you know, its place in the market, uh, even before the R1S, the R1T. Been around a really long time as a, as a business and a company. And I think they've definitely found their groove. And we just hope, hope, hope that they can, they can make it through and bring these vehicles to market. Because if they can... It's going to be really special. Now, I know that's taken up a ton of time on today's podcast, but I hope you think was worth it. So if you'd like to get the show in the podcast form, if you're watching it on YouTube, then you can go to your podcast app. If you're a podcast listener already, you know how to do this. Just search anywhere, Apple, Google, Spotify, your favourite pod app, EV News Daily. Uh, this is one of 2,000 plus episodes of the Daily Podcast, started this years and years ago, to chart the move into electrification, the move to sustainable transportation. We added some news about renewables and grid storage along the way, and hopefully you like what we do here. And uh, I'd invite you to have a look at the podcast, hit subscribe, so whether you've got the visually or audio uh, versions, you are always in touch. In 20 minutes a day, you never need to miss out on the most important EV news around. Now, Tesla is launching... This this is clever, a two-seater Model Y in France to exploit a tax break. At French business owners being the target of this, enabling them to take advantage of a loophole which features a significant storage space of 2,158 litres or 76 cubic feet for commercial use in this Model Y. This Teslarati report pointing out uh, that it's a move by Tesla aiming to move into France's large commercial vehicle market, the 6.3 million vehicles running on diesel mostly at the minute and moving them to electric as quick as possible. The French tax loophole caters for utility vehicles in professional settings. They must have two or three front seats and no rear seats. Uh, we've seen similar things like this before with the, oh, what was it? The Renault Zoe, wasn't it? It had like a van version, which was funny because the Renault Zoe is tiny and it was a van version of that. But to take advantage of this tax loophole in France, Tesla has the skills and tech if they wanted to, to make a commercial vehicle, much like Rivian, who we've talked a lot about today, uh, with the Amazon van, the EDV. Uh, uh, but Tesla choose not to do that and rather do this, which, you know, you could say is a clever workaround for a very specific tax case. Pop a link to, if you want to see more pictures of that crazy two-seater uh, Model Y, in the show notes. Let's stay with Tesla and Powerwall 3 is now officially on the market. Now, they have been installing it for quite some time now, actually, before uh, the new year, but it's now officially open to order on the website. Tesla's highly anticipated Powerwall 3 available across the US with plans to expand to Puerto Rico and Hawaii later this year. Now, Powerwall 3 distinguishes itself from Powerwall Two, by offering, you know, mostly, uh, there's lots of changes, uh, some of them subtle, uh, some of them to do with the integration into your solar and the boxes needed in terms of backup power and stuff like that. But I think the main thing, having a look at the uh, tesla.com website here, is the larger power output, allowing it, to, allowing it to power larger appliances and potentially uh, reducing the number of batteries needed for whole home backup. Now, they are starting to push this. Pricing for Powerwall 3 is $8,400 per unit before taxes and installation fees. The final cost could be reduced, I guess, uh, with the it's called Federal Solar Tax Credit, isn't it? Which could bring maybe 30% or so off. If you've not got the details on that, I'd love to know in the comments below. The price would then come down to, well, less than $6,000. Elon Musk has already disclosed the uh, one of the big things about the Powerwall 3 is the peak power output of 30 kilowatts. Wow. Now, I've got nothing in this house that could possibly pull 30 kilowatts. I know we're on 240 volts and stuff, and it's, it's different over here. But still, um, uh, that's... That's crazy, uh, but also very cool. And uh, and 30 kilowatts of peak power and 11.5 kilowatts of continuous, that's up from seven. Uh, the important thing to note is that Powerwall 3 is not backwards compatible in terms of a mix and match situation, meaning existing Powerwall 2 users can't just add another one of these to get a bit more storage. But find out all the details. I'll pop a link to Tesla's website in the show notes if you'd like to find out more. Well, the war of words continues between China and, well, everybody else, really. But this time it's not Europe and China. It's the US and China. The Energy Secretary Jennifer Granholm expressing concerns about China's domination in the EV scene and potentially dominating the US EV market with affordable models, which would be terrible, of course, if people had cheaper cars to buy and more affordable models. Wouldn't it be awful if people had that option in the marketplace? I know I'm being obviously moderately facetious here. Uh, but that's the point, is that, well, the US car makers at the moment aren't doing it. We know all the reasons why, but 
you can't get any. There are cheap ones, but you're not allowed them because they're from China. The statement follows Joe Biden's similar remarks, emphasising the threat to the US automotive industry as it develops its own manufacturing infrastructure. The CNBC report coming out uh, yesterday says that China surpassed Japan as the leading car exporter in 2023, and their sights are set very high indeed. There are 24 million EVs on the road right now in China. Uh, The Inflation Reduction Act in the US offers tax incentives for EVs, Assembled in North America with conditions attached for critical mineral and battery components and where they're sourced from, vehicles associated with foreign entities of concern. So China, but it's, I mean, it's China, Iran, North Korea and more, uh, Russia in there as well. But it's in, it's the China rule and uh, Energy Secretary Granholm saying that we are very concerned about China bigfooting our industry in the US, even as we are building up now this incredible backbone of manufacturing. Well... That's what she is saying today. But recent U.S. policies haven't yet fully kicked in. I mean, they are aimed at limiting China's access to advanced semiconductor technology, highlighting the ongoing efforts to mitigate uh, potential security and economic risks in China EVs. They've recently been saying, well, we need to think about any data that's being sent back to China from uh, outside of the country. And, you know, that is true. Connected cars do send a lot of data back, not just, you know, the BMS and charge data, but potentially as we've seen with those connected cars, the likes of Tesla, uh, that uh, back on the servers, they can go through the footage and watch you driving your car from the interior camera. Why so many people are putting little covers over their interior Tesla cameras, partly to trick FSD, but also partly because there are multiple stories flying around. We see them on Reddit um, of... Tesla will go through the logs, and that that could be for learning, but you have to trust the company and that they're not going to be used for nefarious means. And so a lot of this is coming from the right place, but I don't think you need to be too scared of China, you know, China doing doing that. But it's obviously a big, big enough concern for the US to still be making it an issue. Let's talk about Ford next and the Ford EV battery facility, uh, known as Blue Oval Battery Park in Michigan, faces ongoing legal hurdles, primarily due to the opposition from local residents over rezoning issues. Now, a recent development saw a court dismiss a complaint from a local group opposing the plant's location, which has since appealed that decision. The dispute centres on a petition that the committee argues was unjustly rejected, aiming to trigger a city-wide vote on rezoning of the land designated for the future Ford EV battery plant. Officials remain positive, they say, on the progress of the project, highlighting the economic benefits to the area, construction, job creation, local business, uh, patronage, etc. And then there's the other issue of Ford's partnership with CATL, the Chinese battery company, who aren't part of this, but Ford are licensing their technology. But yeah, there'll be Chinese boots on the ground at Ford's facility. So, Multiple reasons to oppose this, and Ford continue uh, with this project. Badly needed uh, battery infrastructure and battery supply for their EVs. Now let's talk leasing and deals on the Arnic 5 and Arnic 6. A cheeky little press release dropped into my inbox just now, talking about the Arnic 5 and 6 monthly deals on offer. This is specifically here in the UK, but I saw something similar in the US last week that was $249 per month, and we don't do a lot of financial stuff in terms of like lease deals and stuff on this podcast, because the minute you do it, it's out of date, and it's all to do with like down payments and interest rates and stuff like that. But I thought I'd bring this up as a general talking point, because uh, Hyundai is unveiling their March offers. The deals pertain to the premium rear-wheel drive variant, 77.4 kilowatt-hour battery, Ionic 5 with 315 miles of range, Ionic 6, 322 miles on WLTP, on their eGMP platform, and it allows not only for the ultra-fast charging on, you know, 250-plus kilowatt charging, but coming in at really decent prices. Now, personal contract hire, it's a thing that we have, PCH or PCP over here. Um, the PCH is 299 per month for both vehicles, and there's a business contract uh, business contract hire with rates beginning at £249 per month, which is just an insanely good deal if you do lease your vehicles and you do finance them. I always say that, you know, we don't do that because I don't want to get into the business of car financing and and, and learning all about that. So we buy our vehicles, nearly always used, by the way, um, and that can go well and it cannot go well. I've made money on two EVs that I've sold, sold them for more than I bought them for. Uh, I'm no car dealer, um, but equally the Kona that I bought from uh, dad uh, at the end of 
2022. I'm trying to get my timeline right. I lost a thousand pounds a month on that Kona uh, because we sold it a year later. I bought it for 34, sold it for 21. And that stung. <laughs> I could have financed a vehicle or hired one or whatever uh, for a lot less than that. So I've been bitten on the bum before, but uh, and then the Polestar that we just bought, three-year-old, got it from auction. My friend uh, Nick, or Evie Nick, you'll know him on YouTube as, um, uh, got me that from from, you know, from the auctions for £24,000. And I've seen the dealer selling them from at 26. And so hopefully we can run it for a year. I always treat my vehicles really well and won't lose too much money on that. Touch wood. <laughs> but either way, I'm putting these finance deals out there just so you know that the South Koreans are really serious about getting an EV in your hands. Now, some battery news from the South Koreans. An SK On introduced advanced fast charging EV cells named the Advanced SF and SF Plus at the Interbattery trade show in Seoul in South Korea. And now the original SF battery launched in 2021 had a high nickel content to achieve rapid charging 10 to 80% in 18 minutes. And they have improved on that as well. I found this on the SK on uh, website and it talks about how the advanced SF battery improves by 9% on that existing battery technology, enhancing the energy density and the efficiency and performance, uh, achieving the enhancement by reducing the distance that the lithium ions travel during charging, thanks to a novel coating technique that lowers anode resistance. The SF Plus battery variant promises even faster charging capabilities, and their target is 15 minutes uh, to 80%, 10 to 80%, incorporating a high-capacity silicon and low-resistance graphite in the uh, dual-layer structure this website talks about, the uh, English version of sk.com. Link in the show notes if you're a bit of a battery nerd and you want to find out more. Now, what is a KGM? Well, it's otherwise known, previously known, as a Sangyong, which again might need not, not mean too much to you. Uh, but we've had Sangyong vehicles here in the past, now known as KGM. And they plan to launch the UK's first electric 4x4 pickup, an adaption of the Torres SUV. It's going to launch in early 2025. This also can't report pointing out it's part of their strategy to refresh their brand and go electric uh, after their acquisition by Mahindra a couple of years ago. The upcoming model features a dual motor setup and 300 miles based on the Torres EVX platform modified for all-wheel drive capability, 80 kilowatt hour battery on this truck and uh, they've yet to release all the specs on this uh, but it's going to have 145 kilowatts of power and come to the UK as a truck in early 2025. Now, this aims to stand out in the UK market. We haven't got a big truck culture here. We have got the Maxus T90 EV. I think in Australia and New Zealand, it's the LDV something. Uh, but that's a two-wheel drive, rear-wheel drive electric pickup. Uh, very um, bare bones inside. It's, yeah, it's a working commercial vehicle. It's not meant to be luxurious. Pretty limited functionality off-road, though, being only rear-wheel drive. I'll keep an eye on this story and let you know pricing when it arrives. Now let's talk Volvo. and Vol Well, Volvo trucks, different thing. Volvo trucks hit record sales in 2023, achieving a record-breaking number and a surge in... You know where I'm going with this. Electric truck deliveries. It's always the EV bit of the business that's doing really well. With a 256% increase from the previous year, that totals 1,977 electric trucks globally shipped in 2023. Volvo's market share in the European electric truck segment rose to 47%. Volvo trucks introducing two new EV models, the FH Aero and the FM Low Entry, expanding their range to eight models now. Designed for various different needs, the company has delivered electric trucks now to 45 countries across six continents since 2020, uh, sorry, 2019, including uh, first-time deliveries to countries uh, like uh, Latin America, Morocco, South Korea, Malaysia, all for the first time in 2023. And I think Tesla's semi-truck takes up pretty much most of the oxygen in the room when you come to talk about heavy trucking, but there's it's a really interesting scene and sector with much more happening than just the Tesla thing, which is also very, very good as well. And uh, so congratulations to the team of Volvo. And finally, a story that I'm not sure is getting any attention, really. And I think it should, and I'll tell you why at the end. Leap Motor and Stellantis have got a nod from the Chinese regulators to go ahead with their joint venture. Approval from China's National Development and Reform Commission, the NDRC. It signifies a big step forward in their collaboration. Now, the partnership is all about providing uh, Stellantis with vehicles that are made at a cheaper cost 
for 1.5 billion euros investment into Leap Motor for a 20% stake. It's their largest outside shareholder. The agreement allows Leap Motor to uh, have the exclusive or the exclusivity of export rights for Stellantis to export, sell, and, and locally manufacture Leap Motor products in markets outside Greater China. Sales of Leap Motor vehicles in overseas markets will commence in the third quarter of this year. Now, the first vehicle that's going to come is the C10, being the flagship model for those markets. And this is important because if we're talking about making cars in China and 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 putting these tariffs on the cars coming off the boats out of China, including the Teslas, by the way, that are made at, G- at Giga Shanghai, um, then the Stellantis way is to say, well, we'll invest twenty percent, or we'll own twenty percent of, of Leap Motor, but for that for that one point something billion, we will get exclusive rights to export or produce your cheap Chinese vehicles outside of China for whatever market that could be, South America, that could be. Asia, that could be Europe or the or the US. Does that get around the tariffs that the EU are talking about? I, yeah, pretty much. I, I would think so. Uh, and what about the US? Uh, it's it's Stellantis. They make some great US brands. What about if they also introduced the Leap Motor brand as an, an affordable entry level EV? I mean, it's not a Chinese car. It's a Stellantis car, right? I don't know how this all works, but I think this is it seems like it could potentially be very significant piece of news that well, no one else is talking about today. So I thought I'd I'd bring you that. Well, that's our podcast for today. Thank you for listening. If you'd like to support the show, uh, you can sign up to be one of the patron legends at patreon.com slash evnewsdaily. Uh, you get the podcast first and ad free for 5 or $10 a month. Uh, it's like a posh coffee or two, really. Uh, you can help spread the word about EVs and support the work that I do here. Check out the website, evnewsdaily.com. Uh, there's an archive of over 2,000 episodes if you are really a glutton for punishment. You don't need any more of my face and voice, do you? Uh, but in the podcast, podcast archive. Make sure you're signed up to the audio version as well at EV News Daily in your pod apps. And make sure you're subscribed to the YouTube channel as we work our way towards 10,000 subscribers. That would be amazing to do that uh, by summertime. Thank you for your support. As always, our premium partners, Porsche of the Village in Cincinnati, Audi of Cincinnati East, Volvo Cars of Cincinnati East, National Car Charging on the US mainland and Aloha Charge in Hawaii, Derek Riley from Nevo.ie and the Nevo EV Review Island YouTube channel, Octopus Electroverse, Global Public Charging, made it's simple with one app and one map and lease plan electric moments providing all the tools and guidance ev drivers need have a good and see tomorrow and remember no see you monday what am i saying and remember there's no such thing as a self-charging hybrid